2023 is almost over, and I've got my picks for my favorite and a few of my least favorite movies of the year right now. Hello, everybody. I'm Dan Merle here with my list of my 10 favorite movies and my five least favorite movies of the year. I know it's quite a novelty to actually do this at the end of the year. It seems like much like Christmas itself, the best of season starts earlier every year. I started seeing them pop up at the beginning of December this year, but I try to watch as many movies as I can before I do my list because I want to make sure that I'm seeing as complete a picture of the movie year this year as I possibly can. I'm still, as always, a few behind. There are several movies that I want to see that I didn't get a chance to see because of the wedding and the honeymoon and just because of the flood of award season movies. So you never know, maybe one of your favorites won't be on this list because I haven't had a chance to see it yet, but I have done my absolute best to hit as many as I possibly could. And before we get to my favorite movies of the year, I also like to give out some other awards. This kind of goes back to my days at Screen Junkies when we used to do the screenies. If you want to just jump ahead to the best and worst movies, you can check the time codes down below. But I always like to recognize some other films that maybe won't be on this list, but did achieve various different things in cinema over the last year. Some silly, some not. My first award is for most accurate title. The runner-up is Plane, which was indeed about an airplane, but my winner is Cocaine Bear. It was a very simple title, and it explained the premise of the movie very well. The movie was about a bear on cocaine, and that's a pretty accurate title. The bear, it f***ing did cocaine. A bear did cocaine, Dad! Next up is the Lazarus Award. It's for the movie that was dead and buried but was able to rise from the grave. And I'm giving it to Elemental, which after its opening weekend, many people, including myself, completely wrote off. But it actually had a great second and third act at the box office, both domestically and internationally. And by my estimations, and I'll do some updating on streaming charts with Dan later on, Elemental is also the most streamed movie across all streaming services this year here in the United States domestically. So that is a great turnaround for a movie that many people didn't think really had a chance. I'm sure Disney wishes that a lot of their other films this year had been able to do the same thing, but Elemental really stands in a class by itself. Next up is the award for biggest surprise. It's the movie that I didn't really expect much out of, but that I ended up really enjoying. I had a couple of runners up. One of them is Dungeons and Dragons, Honor Among Thieves, which was so good. I really, really enjoyed that movie. But the winner is Thanksgiving from director Eli Roth. Quite frankly, I have not liked most of Eli Roth's movies, and I wasn't really expecting much from this feature spinoff of a fake parody trailer he did in a movie that came out almost 20 years ago. But Thanksgiving was actually a lot of fun. It's maybe my favorite movie that Eli Roth has ever done. And if you skipped it because you don't like Eli Roth's films, I would suggest giving it a second chance because it really did surprise me. This next award is for most valuable performance. It's for the actor whose performance was most crucial to the film's success or even existence. And I'm giving it to Joaquin Phoenix in Bo is Afraid. I didn't love a lot of what Bo is Afraid did. I did love some of what it did, but the one thing that really held the movie together was Joaquin Phoenix. His performance in that film is exceptional. It should be nominated for the Golden Globe as it is. And even though the movie didn't quite work for me as a whole, Joaquin Phoenix is the reason that it worked at all. I have videos of you. I'll post them. I'll say what you did. What? What did I do? What did I do? Next up is the award for best performance that never had a chance. It's for the actor that gave a performance that will not be nominated for awards and because of the nature of the movie or the performance itself, never really had a shot at any major award nominations. And there are two co-winners this year, both young actors. One of them is Madeline Una Voiles from The Creator, who I thought put in a great performance that will not be recognized because The Creator really isn't being recognized in anything except for technical categories and certainly not on a performance level. And the co winner is Milo Machado Grainer in the film Anatomy of a Fall. That movie is getting a lot of awards attention, but because he is a young actor, I don't see much mainstream buzz for his performance. However, it is one of the best performances of the year by an actor of any age. And when I do my own personal picks for the Oscars, you will probably see his name pop up again.
This next award is for best product movie. It's the best movie about a product. That's pretty self-explanatory. The runners up are Tetris starring Taron Edgerton, which streamed on Apple TV Plus earlier this year, and Blackberry starring Jay Baruchel and Glenn Howerton. But the winner is Air about the development of the Air Jordan at Nike, a great ensemble cast, a really well-written movie, and considered by many to be one of the best films of the year. Yes, product movies can be cynical, and you could even paint some of these with that brush but that doesn't mean they're bad movies and we had three pretty good ones this year. Michael will get a percentage of the revenue of the sale of each shoe that is sold. I'm sorry? This next award is for the best movie that you didn't watch, and the winner is Theater Camp, which is a really good movie that came out of the Sundance Film Festival. It had a late summer release date all lined up. We were getting trailers for it here in my market, but then a little something called Barbenheimer happened, which sucked up all the air in the theatrical market, and in many markets, including this one, Theater Camp never even came out, which is a shame because it is a really, really funny small movie. It's streaming right now on Hulu if you have Hulu and it's definitely worth your time. It's not that the release was small because the movie wasn't good. It's just that there was an unexpected phenomenon at the box office that I think took away a lot of the screens that Theater Camp would have occupied. You so deserve it on every level. You guys are so talented, so unbelievable. This will break you. This will fully destroy you. Next up is the award for best horror franchise comeback. The runner up is Saw X or Saw 10, however you want to say it, which saw the return of Tobin Bell as Jigsaw. It was not maybe the best Saw movie ever made, but it certainly was a return to form after a few disappointing entries. But my winner of this award is Evil Dead Rise, which I thoroughly enjoyed. It tapped back into those Sam Raimi roots, some great practical makeup effects, some great blood, buckets of blood, gore, chainsaws, you name it. Everything that you could want from an Evil Dead movie is in this film, and again, maybe not to the heights of Evil Dead or Evil Dead 2, but still a really enjoyable return to basics for these movies. That's it. Come on now. Do it for mom and dad. Next up is the award for a movie that sounds like a parody but isn't, and traditionally, it's what I give a film that sounds like a parody of a movie that a film critic would like, but actually is a really, really good movie. And this year, it goes to a non-linear three-hour drama revolving around dueling administrative hearings surrounding the development of the atomic bomb, but the joke's on you because it wasn't just critics that liked and saw this movie, it was Oppenheimer. Again, this just goes to show that you can make a great movie out of almost any premise, but if you were to write that on a piece of paper, I think most people would say that that is a boring movie that some critic is going to waste a Sunday afternoon watching. The so-called derogatory information in your indictment of me cannot be fairly understood except in the context of my life. Next up is the award for MVP Actor of the Year, the actor who I think had a great body of work throughout 2023. The runners-up are Jeffrey Wright, who had great turns in Asteroid City and American Fiction, Margot Robbie, who of course led Barbie and had one of the best scenes in Asteroid City, that's a movie that I really liked, and Jason Schwartzman, who had a great voice turn as the bad guy in Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, was also great in Asteroid City, and then was a real scene-stealer in The Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, but I'm giving my MVP actor award this year to maybe not the flashiest actor, but the one that I think showed the most range in the most different kinds of films, and that is Alden Ehrenreich. You know, I kind of root for the guy because Solo wasn't his fault. He had a great supporting turn in Oppenheimer, holding his own against Robert Downey Jr. He was also really funny in Cocaine Bear, I think maybe my favorite part of the film. It wasn't a great film, but he was really funny in it. And then he had a really strong lead dramatic turn in a Netflix film called Fair Play, if you haven't seen it. It is a very intense psychological drama between a couple when work gets in the way between them. I never got the shot. Do you have any idea what that feels like to be treated as so irrelevant like a f***ing cord waiting to get cut? So looking at his entire filmography for the year and the fact that, like I said, I'm kind of rooting for the guy, I'm naming Alden Ehrenreich my MVP actor of 2023. The bear is a girl. Oh, yeah. how do you know that? 
because its vagina is on my ear. And finally, fittingly, is the End of an Era Award, and that award goes to big-budget comic book movies about mid-tier characters, and honestly, even some A-tier characters. Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania disappointed, Shazam! Fury of the Gods disappointed, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom disappointed, the Marvels disappointed, even the Flash disappointed. It wasn't a great year to be a comic book movie unless you were Spider-Man or the Guardians of the Galaxy, which have been sort of graduated to the A-list. And I think people are really going to look back at 2023 as the year that studios stopped spending huge money on any kind of comic book movie. Unfortunately, there are several still on the schedule for 2024 that may continue to have this lesson pounded into them at the box office. This is inevitable. We can try a million times and we're not going to be able to fix this. No matter what we do, this world dies. So those are my awards for 2023. Before I get to my 10 favorite movies, let's talk about five of my least favorite. And it's kind of an interesting group because I didn't really hate a lot of movies this year, which is a good thing. So really when I was trying to pick through this and pick my bottom five films, these are really the five movies that I would not want to sit through again the most. And coming in at number five is a recent release. I'm sure a lot of people won't be happy with it. It's Rebel Moon Part One, A Child of Fire. Listen, I liked the Snyder Cut. I actually liked Army of the Dead, but I did not like this movie. It was very difficult for me to get through. It absolutely felt its length. I'm not interested in a longer director's cut, and I certainly hope that the second film is better, but there are several things, including menial labor, that I would rather do than sit through Rebel Moon Part 1 another time. They didn't just destroy it. They tortured every man, woman, and child. In fourth place is Knights of the Zodiac, which was a long-delayed film and anime adaptation, and as many anime adaptations go when it comes to live action, was just not very good. I mean, it's not Last Airbender bad or Dragon Ball Evolution bad, but really what is, it just seemed like it went on forever. Ever, so I would definitely not want to sit through that one again. In third place, I mentioned the fact that there were a lot of disappointing comic book films, and listen, I liked this one less than a lot of people, but I'd have to pick the Marvels, and it was really disappointing for me to even put it on this list, but out of all of the disappointing superhero films this year, I felt that this one had the least structure, had the least story for me to cling on to. The Flash, even, I liked some of the stuff that they did in the movie. This one, I thought, just structurally completely fell apart. The character stuff didn't work for me. I just didn't like it that much, and it comes in at number three. Annihilation! I don't like that name. The top two are both movies that I did actually really hate, and at number two is a movie that I actually warned you about on this show last year. I saw it at Sundance 2022, but it wasn't officially released until January of this past year. It's called When You Finish Saving the World. It's directed by Jesse Eisenberg. I hated every single character in this movie, and not in a Glenn Gary Glenn Ross way, in a why are you putting me through this way. I'm actually writing a song right now. Oh, it's a political song. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's going to be so political, it's going to change the f***ing world, and you're going to be so embarrassed they didn't think of it. This movie was interminable. It drove me nuts. I hated every minute of watching it. I didn't want to spend any more time with these characters, and I don't think that that was the intended effect. Don't watch this movie, because I think you're going to be in for a really bad time. I have 20,000 followers, and I think what they like about me is my passion and charisma, and I thought you had that too. Thanks. And at number one, my least favorite movie of the year, I think it came out fairly early on in the year, and that's Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. Listen, I love a really good, weird, bad, fun movie. I watched Slother House, for God's sake. But I hated this film because it's cynical. It didn't even try to do anything fun or different with the concept. It was literally just, huh, we're gonna do Winnie the Pooh, but it's a horror movie. And then whatever the lowest common denominator of that is. And the sad thing is that it worked. It made a bunch of money. He's doing another one of these things. He's doing a whole public domain universe with characters that don't have copyright protection anymore. I'm not against the concept of this. I think you could have made a really fun movie. This wasn't a really fun movie. It was just bad and stupid and it worked and I'm angry and it's number one for those reasons. Oh. Let her go. Let her, let her. I'll stay with you forever. Take me instead. Okay, enough of the bad. Let's talk about the good. My favorite movies of 2023, and in a way similar to the bad ones, there were only two or three movies that I really, really loved, where I said that's 
absolutely on my list. And the rest of the films were all kind of mashed together. There were actually about 20 that could easily have been in my top 10. So when I was trying to figure out which ones make the list and which ones don't, it's the movies that I thought about more, the ones that really kind of crawled under my skin and made me ask different questions or, or maybe just dazzled me with the way that they were made. In a year where it was tough to kind of parse which ones are the top 10 and which ones are runners up, that was the difference maker. And before I get to my top 10, there were several runners up that could just as easily have been at probably number 10 through number four on this list. 20 Days in Mariupol was a documentary about the early days of the war in Ukraine. I never want to watch the movie again, but it was exceptionally well made and powerful. Air, as I mentioned, I thought was a very, very good film with some strong performances. One of the best films of the early part of the year. American Fiction is also a really good film that came out at the end of the year. Jeffrey Wright is being pushed for best actor as he should be because he's great in this movie. Sterling K. Brown is great in this movie. If you haven't seen it, I've thought about this one a lot. It would probably be number 11 on this list if I were going to rank it 11 through 20. These books have nothing to do with African-American studies. They're just literature. The, the blackest thing about this one is the ink. Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret is a movie that I really liked. And again, it shows that you can make a relatable human story, even if it's not an experience that the viewer, namely me, can directly connect with. You understand these characters and their emotions, and it was really, really well done. Asteroid City from Wes Anderson. I mentioned it a few times. I really liked this film. It wasn't for everybody. I loved the ensemble cast. I loved the production design, and I loved just about everything about the execution of this film. Hayao Miyazaki's The Boy and the Heron was very close to being on my top 10 list. Again, not a movie for everybody, but I thought it was a stunningly beautiful film, and I actually liked the sort of lyrical tone of the movie. Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves. Yes, it was one of my favorite movies of the year. It was funny. It felt like an old school adventure like the kind of movie that you used to see in theaters all the time. Also, Martin Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon, a movie that I really liked but didn't love and honestly haven't thought about as much since I saw it a couple months ago. I think the performances are good, but I think that the length really bogged it down and kept it out of my top 10. Scrapper is a little movie, a tiny little movie that had a very small release, but that you can get on streaming right now. It's about a young girl who reunites with her father and them sort of building their dynamic. It's just a really sweet funny movie. And then Society of the Snow from J.A. Bayona. It actually doesn't come out on Netflix until the beginning of the year. I believe on January 4th is when it streams, but it is technically a 2023 release for awards purposes. It's the same story that you've already seen adapted into the film Alive, but this isn't the Hollywood version. It's much grittier. You have a cast that is much closer to the nationalities of the actual people that went through this experience, and it is a harrowing film, especially if you don't know the details of the plane crash that happened up in the Andes Mountains. So look out on Netflix in the coming days for this one. It is definitely worth your time. And so we've arrived now at my top 10 favorite movies of the year. I think this might be my most eclectic grouping of movies that I can remember, at least since I've been making these lists for YouTube. And at number 10 is a movie that I certainly would never have expected would be on my top 10 for the year. And that is Godzilla Minus One. I really, really liked this movie. And it's not just that it's a great monster movie, which, by the way, it is. I love how they treated Godzilla. The fact that he's a mean, nasty, ugly monster who's just coming to eat you and destroy your town and kill everything that you loved. You're going kind of back to the basics there, the horror of Godzilla. But also because of what it did with the characters and the commentary on post-war Japan. In many ways, I think that it is a strange companion piece with Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer this year year because of what it's saying about post-war guilt and things like that. I did not expect a Godzilla movie to make me think as much as Godzilla Minus One made me think, and it's that depth that the movie had that got it up to number 10, a very competitive number 10. I probably had three or four movies that were slotted in there, but Godzilla Minus One takes the spot. <laughs> At number nine is Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. I think that Into the Spider-Verse may be my favorite Spider-Man movie of all time. It's pretty competitive. And I thought that this was a fantastic sequel. It upped the game as far as animation. They could have just made a clone of the last movie, but they really tried to do something new and expand the universe. I loved the addition of Spider-Man 2099, voiced by Oscar Isaac. I thought that it took the story of Miles and Gwen into interesting places. You care more about them as characters. It deepened their 
relationship with each other and with their family. And I think it kind of did everything that a sequel is supposed to do. It expanded the world and enriched the characters and what you know about them. And it left people wanting more. I know that to be continued ending wasn't for everybody. I think if they'd kept that part one on the movie, then it would have set expectations a little bit better. But I think this still works really well as a standalone film, especially as an example of just what you can do in animation and the boundaries that are still being pushed. Everyone keeps telling me how my story is supposed to go. Nah. I'm gonna do my own thing. At number eight is Past Lives from writer-director Celine Song about two childhood friends who reunite as adults and explore what may have been if they hadn't been separated as kids. This is a very small movie. It's a very quiet movie. It's the kind of movie that is easy to overlook. I almost did overlook it, but the more that I thought about it, the more I remembered how much I appreciate the human connections between these characters, the complicated dynamics, especially when one of the characters is married and you're wondering well, what's going to happen with this relationship as are the characters in the film. It didn't shy away from the difficult questions that arise in a situation like this, but it also didn't fall into cliche. I thought it just seemed like a very human, a very natural story, very naturalistic, believable, likable performances. It's just an all around really good, strong movie. And a lot of these movies have big bombastic things about them. Past Lives doesn't really have any of that, but it's just solid and it comes in at number eight. He's your childhood sweetheart. And it's not like you're gonna run away with him. At number seven is a movie that I liked more than just about everybody that I've talked to. People said that I was crazy for liking this movie as much as I did, but that doesn't intimidate me. And if I think it's one of my favorite movies of the year, it's going on the list. And that is The Creator. I understand that people didn't like the story. They said it was derivative. I didn't find it to be that way. Yes, it is inspired by other stories, but unlike Rebel Moon, one of my least favorite movies of the year, I felt that this actually put compelling characters into some of these sci-fi narratives that we've seen before. Before, and the world building, the way that Gareth Edwards was able to build a world unlike any I had seen before. The fact that it was able to achieve what it did on the budget that it had is incredible. I was very sad that it didn't do better at the box office. I understand that people didn't like it as much as I did, but man, I love this movie. It's one of my favorite pieces of sci-fi, really of the 21st century. And if I'm alone on the creator island, then I'll be over here enjoying this movie by myself. I love the creator, and it's number seven on my list. We can't go to heaven because you're not good. And I'm not a person. At number six is Alexander Payne's The Holdovers. I think one of the best performances, if not the best, of Paul Giamatti's career. Divine Joy Randolph is rightfully getting huge Best Supporting Actress buzz for her role in the film and really just the ensemble cast in general. And again, much like Past Lives, this is a very small, a very human story about flawed people who find each other through no choice of their own and make connections with each other. It's a dryly funny movie. It packs a punch emotionally when it needs to. I love the resolution that everybody finds in this story or even sometimes lack of resolution. And it just kind of unfolds naturally. It doesn't feel like a script that's been written. It feels like you are watching an episode from these people's lives. These were a gift to me and I would like to share them with both of you. Look at them. Look at all the festive shapes. Snowflakes and gingerbread men. A little mitten. <laughs> mm. Alexander Payne just has a gift for making the characters in his films feel like people I know. Like I want to call up these old friends and check in on them and see how they're doing after the movie's over. And that's really what you want to achieve with a movie like this. And that's why The Holdovers is on the list. You hit him? What, like punched him out? Nope, I hit him with a car. Oh. You got kicked out of Harvard for hitting a guy with a car? By accident. I'd have Jim Beam, please. At number five is a movie that just hit streaming not too long ago and doesn't seem to have huge appeal thus far, but that I really enjoyed. And that's Bradley Cooper's Maestro. I said in my review of the film that I seem to be drawn to movies about music and musicians. And I thought that this was a fascinating portrait of Leonard Bernstein. I know that some people are disappointed that it didn't focus more on his work. I think that we know his work. I wanted to know more about the man behind the work, which is very much what the movie is about. And as great as Bradley Cooper is, I think that Carrie Mulligan is even better. The best actress race this year is going to be very difficult to decide because we have three or four contenders that I think would have won the award if they weren't competing against each other. Because it's so draining, Lenny. It's so 
fucking draining to love and accept someone who doesn't love and accept themselves. And that's the only truth I know about you. I love the way that the movie shot. I love how the look of the film evolves throughout the different eras. I love the sound of the film, especially the scene where we see Leonard Bernstein conducting Mahler and just the overwhelming sonic nature of that scene. I think that Bradley Cooper's great. If you don't like his performance, if it's too stagey, I get that. It worked for me. And then just generally, I thought that it was a very compelling portrait of flawed people and a flawed genius and the heart of his life and of his relationship and what made these two people tick. And as I mentioned in my review, it also memorably name drops one of my favorite animated characters of all time. Maybe that bumped it up the list? I don't know. Alex, who left, who abandoned Snoopy in the vestibule? Oh, uh, Who abandoned Snoopy? At number four is a movie that generated more controversy than I expected once I posted my review, and that is Yorgos Lanthimos's Poor Things, starring Emma Stone as Bella, who is finding her way through the world. Willem Dafoe is great. Mark Ruffalo has my favorite, I think, supporting performance in any movie this year. And again, best supporting actor this year is going to be a death match. And so many people push back on the concept, the idea that Bella is created initially with a child's brain. And I think that people heard that concept and ran with it and said like, well, if she has the brain of a child, then how can anything in this movie be appropriate? I think it is so much more about the journey of Bella. She starts out childlike, but the movie itself is about her maturation and her evolution. I didn't find the film to be inappropriate or exploitative or worse names that people have thrown at it. I think that that's the entire point of the film. And I think that by having Bella learn through her own eyes, not looking through society's eyes, she provides that outsider perspective. I understand that people disagree with that, but I, this is the one movie, you know, art is subjective and things like acting and stuff, you know, that's just debating what you like. Poor Things for me is the one movie that I feel like I could have an academic debate on if you don't like Bella's journey in the movie, because I think that is so inherent to the core of the film. Regardless, not only the acting, but also the look of the film, the cinematography. I loved the score, the way that it was shot. On a technical level, it was great. On an acting level, it was great. I loved the performances. I loved the script. And so I loved Poor Things. It is your body, Bella Baxter. You also to give freely. I generally charge 30 francs. Well, that seems low. At number three is a movie that won the Palme d'Or, the top prize at the Cannes Film Festival. So it came in with a lot of hype and it lived up to that hype. And that is Anatomy of a Fall, which was not selected by France to be its entrant for best international film, but which is still going to be in competition, I think, in a few different categories at the Academy Awards. It is sort of like an art house law and order. There is a death and the entire movie is about the inquest into that death. And then you realize that the movie isn't really a whodunit or a mystery. History. It's about unraveling this relationship between a husband and a wife. And I mentioned the performance by Milo Machado Grainer, who plays the couple's young son. His role grows as the film goes until it reaches what I thought was a very emotionally satisfying and complex finale. There is a lot of talking in this movie, but I like talking movies if they're talking about something interesting. And I was riveted to Anatomy of a Fall as if it were an action thriller because you don't know about this stuff beforehand. It's not about the characters learning something that the audience already knows you are learning things along with the characters in this movie that completely changes your perspective on everything i really 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 like this film it was your choice to come here and start this renovation this is your own trap okay so now you're it's talking your own about trap the past. no i'm not taking time point, from you to waste it all that. on your own i want things to change now Sandra Huller puts in a fantastic lead performance in Anatomy of a Fall, and she puts in a fantastic supporting performance in my second place film, The Zone of Interest, which is a devastating film. This is another one that I'll probably only watch a handful of times in my life, but not because it's not a good movie, because it is absolutely haunting. If you don't know the premise of the movie, then I don't necessarily want to give it away because the movie kind of parses out the information in little snippets, but it is set during World War II, and it is about the everyday horror that can happen in the background of everyday life and how people can see the reality that they choose to see, can believe what they want to believe, can ignore what they choose to ignore until reality makes it impossible to ignore those truths anymore. The sound design on this film is almost a lead character because there are atrocities that are happening that you never see 
It never shows any of the terrible things that are happening just outside the camera's range, but you hear them. And it is more haunting than it would have been if they had actually shown you those things. The movie also takes some real creative risks, including near the climax of the movie with an editorial choice that I think was a big gamble, but one that pays off because you're not quite sure what's happening. And then it really just hits you like a gut punch. Again, this is a very devastating, emotional, disturbing movie, but I think it is also an essential movie because it's not just a period piece. It is very much about humanity and how easy evil can exist every single day if you just choose to ignore it. It is a lesson that I think is as important now, perhaps more important now, the further we get from World War II as it ever was. And that brings me to my number one movie, my favorite film of the year. Sometimes there's a movie that I see that's number one, and then it gets bumped off of that spot by some of the movies that come out at the end of the year. That's happened the last few years, as I recall. But this film has been my number one for quite some time, and I really would have been surprised, honestly. It, it would have taken a fantastic film to knock it out of my number one spot. And that is Oppenheimer. I think the hands down best cinematic experience of the year. And as I said in my review also, the movie that I think Christopher Nolan has been building up to making for his entire career. It is the culmination of every skill that we have seen from Nolan at an A plus quality. The editing, the nonlinear style, the sound design, the cinematography, the acting, everything in this movie works for me. Some people apparently were disappointed in it. They thought that it was just a bunch of people talking in a room. They thought that the A-bomb explosion was too small. I think that is only looking at the aesthetics of the film. When you look at the actual structure of it and what it means and the way that it's constructed, it really is not just my favorite movie this year, easily one of my favorite movies of the decade. I think one of my favorite movies of the 21st century thus far. And there was really no movie I saw this year that was like it. There was no movie I saw this year that approached for me the culmination of everything that a director and a team of actors and a team of technical professionals can do as far as the effect of cinema. And that is such a big thing for Christopher Nolan. The effect of the screen size, the effect of the sound, Everything for him is about impact on the audience. This movie impacted me like no other movie. I'm also so happy that it succeeded. It's not one of those great movies that I can say, oh, if only people had gone. This shows you that people will show up for something unique and interesting and new and innovative. And that tells audiences that it is imperative that you go see it. Studios should look at Oppenheimer and take notes. This is how you get an audience to turn out to a great movie and a challenging movie. And my favorite movie, of 2023. You could lift the stone without being ready for the snake that's revealed. We have to make the politicians understand this isn't a new weapon. It's a new world. And there you have it. Some of my least favorite films of the year, my favorite movies of the year, and some other awards. What do you think? Are there movies that you loved this year that weren't on my list? Are there movies that you hated that you said, wait a minute, how did that get on there? Let me know down in the comments below and stay tuned right here on the channel. I'm going to have a preview of 2024 coming up soon. And on a personal note to everybody that watched the channel here in 2023, thank you so much. We are growing slowly, but we are still growing. And mainly, I just love that this is a space where I can take my weird perspective on movies and talk about box office numbers and all the other stuff on this channel and do what I want to do and have a group of people show up and watch it. I appreciate the time you spent with me in 2023. I hope we bring even more people into the club in 2024. Until next time, stay safe and I'll see you then. Bye.